going to be talking about a, a new pipeline that uh, we've developed, uh, the L1K++ pipeline for processing Lynx L1000 data, which uh, improves the accuracy of the, uh, the gene expression data from which all, all the inferences we, uh, are made uh, later on downstream. The L1K++ pipeline is named L1K++ because it's uh, completely written in C++, and it starts <coughs> It starts processing from the uh, the raw level one data, so the actual fluorescent level uh, values is, is where it starts the processing from. And the main idea L1K++ is to combine data from different replicates in order to increase accuracy. And um, I'll show you some data at the end, which uh, shows that this results in at least a 60% reduction in noise when, uh, in the uh, deconvoluted expression values. Gene ex expression. Um, also, it turns out um, that due to the nature of the data, this is very, very fast. Uh, the implementation is more than a thousand times faster than the current Broad implementation. Uh, uh, sorry, the Broad uh, implementation or uh, pipeline. Uh, it takes five hours to uh, process the entire L1000 data set, and that's just on a single uh, eight-core uh, instance on uh, on uh, on Azure. Um, just to give context, it takes roughly five hours, six hours to uh, to process a single plate right now using the, the current pipeline. Um, and again, it's mainly due to the, the nature of the data. Uh, it allowed uh, um, me to uh, write some uh, very scalable linear constant time implementations which allowed uh, us to do it uh, this quickly. And the goal of this, of course, is that uh, you know, uh, if you have good data, good uh, to, to start with, we'll get much uh, more accurate inferences uh, downstream when we look at uh, uh, the different signatures that are going to be generated. Uh, so this is the outline of, uh, of my talk. So first I'll review uh, the L1000 data, what it is, uh, this, uh, get, to get uh, a sense of uh, what, what we're actually working with. Um, then I'll go through the, the current pro processing pipeline and then head into the, the new L1K++ pipeline. Um, I'll go into how um, we combine and normalize the data from, from rep replicates and how we are uh, using a new methodology to, uh, to separate the, uh, the gene expression signals using a Gaussian mixture model expectation maximization protocol. And then uh, show you some preliminary data, show that you know uh, this this actually works, and uh, go through uh, a short to-do list of, uh, of things we we are, are looking to do in the in the near future in order to uh, define lines of pipeline. So um, the L1000 data we're looking at uh, it's a, it's a bead-based system, and um, essentially um, we. Uh, uh, a reader uh, takes up uh, the beads, uh, draws up the beads uh, from from a well. Uh, we have two lasers which detect the uh, the, the uh, two sets of colored dyes in the uh, in the bead to identify what what bead it is, and another laser which uh, actually measures the uh, the amount of uh, RNA that's bound to the probes. Uh, and this gives rise, this is a, just a summary of, of the scale of the data we're looking at. So we have 4,000 plates, uh, each with 384 wells, and these can be control or treatment wells. That gives uh, us around, and there's about 40,000 beads in each of these wells. Now 10 of these bead types, uh, I, I call them bead colors for, for, for shorthand, they're actually two colors that, that, are, that are measured, but uh, so 10 of these bead colors are, are used for um, for standards. The other 499 bead colors are reserved for the genes of interest. This is what we're actually measuring. Um, the twist that the Broad has is that uh, they, in order to increase the number of, of genes that, uh, uh, gene level, expression levels that can be measured at the same time, two genes are assigned to the same color. Um, now that would give 980 genes, but actually two of the uh, uh, beads only are uh, to the analytes are, are actually used. So there's 978 genes that are, are actually measured. 
Um, we have 1.4 million experiments. 1.4 million wells are, are uh, uh, assay have been assayed in the in the data set, and this gives rise to 55 billion feeds. And this is the uh, the um, the data that uh, the actual raw data, you know, 55 billion data points. So this is a schematic of the the broad uh, processing uh, pipeline. Um, at level one. That's the actual raw fluorescence values. Those are the 55 billion data points I was talking about. The first thing that Broad does is to take these uh, and uh, deconvolute the two uh, gene expression signals. Uh, and that gives us a level two data. Uh, and then what they do is they do a, uh, a normalization step with those, with those uh, 10 wells that I said was re reserved for standards. Um, and a second normalization step uh, with uh, quantile normalization, and a, uh, then they apply the matrix to infer the uh, the other 20,000 genes, and that gives us level three uh, data. Level four data they compare between replicates to get uh, z values, and level five data is going to be I'm not quite sure some some sort of machine learning in order to give us some uh, some signatures, and we haven't seen that yet. So the Major differences in the L1K++ pipeline, as opposed to the uh, as uh, as uh, compared to the Broad pipeline, are, are summarized here. The Broad approach is to uh, treat each of these uh, replicates. They do the experiments in, in anywhere from two to six replicates, um, and they treat each replicate as a separate data set, which is deconvoluted in order to get the gene expression levels. And then later, later on, they compare the gene expression levels for consistency across replicates. Now, the L1K++ approach is to uh, combine all the data from the replicates and then deconvolute. So it, it's basically treating uh, all the replicate wells as one big well, uh, one big block of data. Um, second difference is that uh, in order to do deconvolution, in order to separate the, the two signals out, uh, they use a key means method. Um, exactly how, I'm not quite sure, but uh, uh, I, I think I, I figured exactly what they have, have done from, from different sources. Um, in any case, L1K++ uses a, um, uh, a modified Gaussian mixture model expectation maximization protocol, which uh, works a lot better. Um, the Broad because you're looking at, uh, they're comparing cross replicates, they do have to normalize, but that's done uh, after deconvolution. With L1K++, the normalization happens before deconvolution. In fact, it's, it's a necessary step you know, to, to account for variations between the different wells before combining the data. Uh, but again, I'll show you that this, this actually does work, that um, even though we're looking at um, uh, different wells and different plates, the, uh, the normalization is very, very effective, and uh, you can actually treat them as uh, one, one big uh, pool of, uh, of, of data points. Um, and finally, um, the Broad treats their data sort of in a static manner. Um, you have the different levels, and it's not easy to go back and forth between the, uh, the different levels. And that's a large part because it, it's a lot of work to, uh, to, to go through the to go through and get partial results, to go through uh, the processing and, and get uh, partial results to look at. Uh, with L1K++, uh, it's, as I said, it's really, really fast. So it's, it's, you can go back and check your raw data, get some intermediate results, look at some histograms. It's, it's not a big deal. Uh, it's, it's actually designed so that you can do that. So if you get a result uh, later on and you want to check to see whether you know, it's reasonable from, from the, uh, the original data, you can do this. So this is an overview of the um, the pipeline. Um, first thing that that was done is that we t uh, we took the level one data and um, made it into a, a more compact uh, form, uh, which I'll describe. And that's level one point five data. Uh, this is a completely lossless. The uh, 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 the the, action, the, the, the level one data was completely preserved in the transformation of level 1.5 data. Then um, we combined the data from all the control wells uh, from the cell line. And, that, and so instead of looking at all the, uh, comparing uh, a treatment well against 
a control well and doing this multiple times, we take all the control wells and do the deconvolution to get uh, a single set of values uh, for, for that set of conditions. And uh, uh, we're talking about a few wells here. Uh, some of the cell lines uh, have several thousand uh, replicates with essentially the same conditions uh, for, for DMSO. Um, and then uh, we do the same thing for replicate treatment wells. Uh, the replicates, there uh, are at least two replicates for every treatment, uh, uh, two replicates of every experiment, and uh, in some cases uh, uh, there, there can be six replicates. Um, so it, it's still, the, that's significant. The number, of, uh, increasing the number of beats by uh, several fold is significant in reducing the, uh, the amount of noise. And in order for this to work, we uh, use a quantum normalization scheme uh, to, uh, to normalize the data uh, across wells. And I'll go through and describe that in more detail. But without this normalization scheme, we really couldn't combine the data. Well, we could combine the data, but it wouldn't give us any, any increase in signal. Um, so then after we've combined the data, then we separate the two signals out for each of the, uh, the different types of beads. And this is uh, using a, a modified Gaussian mixture model uh, procedure. And this generates uh, what we call level 2.5 data. It's not quite level 2 data because it's been quantum normalized, but it's not quite level 3 data because we haven't done the inference. Um, and then um, we intend to do some post-processing to, to scale and further clean up the data after we've, uh, we've done the, the, the deconvolution. And uh, the goal, our, our primary goal really is to obtain signatures and uh, infer uh, regulatory networks. So, um, so this is a, uh, not the most interesting thing in the world. The data, uh, it's very important. Uh, it all starts with the data. So it's important to know uh, how the data is, is, uh, is organized. Um, so it, at level one, what we have are LXB files. Uh, L, the LXB format is a reasonable format, but it's, um, it's not restricted at 1,000 um, or it's, a generalized format that's used in um, by by different spectr spectral uh, photometers and um, uh, lab instruments. Um, the good thing about it, even though it's proprietary, is there are a lot of readers for it uh, in R, MATLAB, Python, Java, C++, and it stores raw counts data. But it, the problem is that um, because it's a generalized format there are a lot of fields which aren't being used. Um, so we're storing a, a lot of zeros, uh, which, which, are, which are taking up a lot of space. Um, the level two data is stored in text files. Uh, this is after deconvolution, and it's a reasonable thing to do. There's, they don't take up, even though, it, it, because it's easy to read in, uh, currently our level 2.5 data is, is stored in a, uh, in a similar format. Um, level three and four data is stored in uh, GTX files which is an HDF5 binary format. Uh, it's essentially one big table with, uh, with no indices is, is how it's organized. And this, struggling with this uh, is probably what started me on, 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 on uh, redoing the pipeline, uh, it's strange to say. Uh, it's, it's very slow and the, the, uh, the um, provide utilities from the HDF5 are buggy, especially when it, for C++. So anyway, for L1K++, uh, the, the basic data format is a binary, uh, it's a binary level 1.5 file format. And essentially, the first field gives us the, the analyte. The second field tells us how many uh, fluorescent values, how many beads there are, how many fluorescent values follow. And then you get the, and then after that, you look at the second analyte, number of beads, and, and, number, and then followed by the the, the number, the, the actual values. So it's a very, very compact uh, format. It's very, very easy to read and very, very fast. And it's completely lossless. The, the native data is actually in 16-bit integers. So uh, that's, that's what the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the reader actually, actually uh, uh, stores in, in its native uh, format. So uh, the level 1.5 data is stored uh, one file for each well. And that's, a, it's not, and it's done so because that's really the, the natural way of reading the data is to look at, at one well at a time. Um, and just using this 
this data format uh, reduces the size of the level one data from one for five terabytes uh, uh, in, uh, when compressed to 120 gigabytes. And this is quite significant um, in terms, it took me like uh, two weeks to actually go and read and decompress the level one uh, data and, and uh, go to level 1.5. And reading in files is actually, a, a, can be a major time um, time uh, component for for, uh, for these data processing pipelines. Um, also, the format is, is it's very simple, so it's easy to convert back and forth uh, from, from this to uh, higher data levels. So let's look at the data. This is um, uh, a histogram of the, uh, the actual raw data from a single well, uh, looking at one single uh, analyte, one single beat color, uh, number 101. And uh, on the x-axis is, um, uh, is the intensity. Uh, it's been transformed to a, a log 2 scale. Uh, on the y-axis are the, uh, the fraction of beats that have that intensity. Now, um, even though it's a histogram, this is the actual uh, native data format. It, it, um, I haven't actually combined any values together. Uh, haven't binned any values together. This is this is this is really completely unprocessed data, and in this case, it's you can see the two signals. It's actually very very easy to uh, to um, to separate the signals, and that's not why I'm showing this. Um, it's really to show the motivation behind this and and how how signals combine. When I looked at this, um, we're looking at the signal from like 70 beats, and was trying to figure out um, how best to to, uh, to de deconvolute the signals. In this case, it's very simple. The first thing that came to my mind is that, well, what is the variation? Uh, uh, if we were to look at the same signal uh, or the same the same conditions, what is the variation in, in terms of the uh, the data that we get? Um, and if you look at controls, you can get uh, essentially this is just a DMSO uh, mock treatment. Six hours later, they're harvested. There's uh, with the same cell line, there are 767 wells with exactly the same, uh, under exactly the same conditions. So the first thing that came to me was that, well, why don't I look at it all the time and see where, where the variation is or what type of variation that I'm seeing. And um, so this is what you get if you superimpose 776 wells, control wells, uh, with uh, mock treatment of DMSO in the same cell line uh, at six hours. So you can see that uh, roughly the, the signal, of course, is going to, uh, to overlap. You do get peaks. But you can see to the left, the leading edge, there's, uh, there are these little bumps. And um, so what's happening here is that um, even though uh, in each of the wells you're trying to load a, um, uh, the same amount of RNA, uh, uh, you do an OD and you try to load the same amount of RNA, uh, there's going to be a variation in RNA preps uh, in terms of how much of that RNA is degraded and how much of it is going to be active. So what you're seeing there is a general uh, bleeding of the signal to the left as uh, where, when there's more uh, degraded RNA. You're not going to get as much of, an, of a fluorescent signal. Uh, and this can be normalized out um, using quantile normalization. And this is what it looks like after we've uh, performed the, uh, the quantile normalization. <laughs> Um, so we see that uh, those the the signal that was to the left uh, after we've corrected for uh, the the uh, differences in, um, in in overall amount of active RNA now form a nice very very sharp peak. Now this doesn't make any difference really when you're looking at 767 wells. I mean I mean anyone can you could you could you could deconvolute those signals by eye, but we wanted to apply the same technique. To, uh, to a case where we don't have uh, thousands of beads to look at when we're looking at replicate wells where uh, we're only dealing with a few hundred beads and where, where uh, uh, the, the normalization is necessary in order to, to make sure that the, the, the signals can be combined accurately. And, then, and so how are we doing the normalization? Uh, so this is what's being done. We're taking the um, all the values within the bead. 
uh, I mean, all the values, all the bead values within the well, and there's 40,000 values. So we're not uh, discriminating by uh, by uh, bead type. We're taking just all the fluorescent values that are present in that well. And this makes sense because that the, a well represents a single experiment, and um, each of the analytes, the ones that um, um, are, have been chosen to essentially um, represent the expression across the entire uh, uh, the entire genome. So they should be representative. Uh, the, the overall uh, 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 set of values should be representative of the the uh, an unbiased representation of the the RNA uh, levels in that well. So the general procedure is to take the uh, the control wells, then we um, average out the cumulative distributions in order to form a reference distribution. Um, and so, and and the control wells, like I said, can be several hundred to several thousand. So uh, the reference distribution is a very good representation of, of uh, the average activity of eRNA in each well. And then we uh, quantile normalize uh, each treatment well against that reference distribution. Um, or And uh, by that, you basically map the, the cumulative distribution of uh, uh, the treatment well onto the reference distribution. And uh, basically stretch the distribution to match uh, what what is uh, uh, observed and this works very very well the what I showed you with um, previously uh, uh, this the, the type of sharpening that I showed you here is is typical uh, this this is happens in almost every single case with the uh, with the um, uh, uh, the analytes so Let's get on to uh, separating the signals, the deconflation, the deflution protocol. Now, um, if you were here for, for Chad's talk, um, you'll know that um, um, he observed that uh, uh, oftentimes the signals got switched. That um, uh, in using the Broad protocol, uh, you would see uh, uh, the two signals being misassigned to the two genes. To the, to the genes. And so this deconvolution protocol is, is a key step. This is probably where most of the noise in, uh, in the data comes from. And so our protocol is to take, uh, for the controls, we combine the data, data from all the replicates, same cell line, same time. They could be different plates. Um, and here we have a very, very good signal. When we do this, I, uh, we have tens of thousands of data points. We're not talking 50, 100 data points, tens of thousands of data points. And when you do that, you don't have to do clustering anymore. You can use uh, spectroscopy techniques in order to, to, uh, to find out where, where, to, uh, where the peaks are. And then uh, you can use that to get even better estimates for uh, using Gaussian mixture model. For the treatment wells, you don't have as many, but you still, um, uh, we still combine the data. So we're going from uh, 100 beats, maybe 200, 300 beats, still significant. Uh, but we can't use peak picking routines to, uh, to uh, get initial estimates of where the peaks are. So we use a um, uh, modified, well, I use a modified MCLUST procedure to see. MCLUST is a uh, model-based clustering um, procedure that was developed by, uh, by Adrian Raftery, and um, it's, it works very, very well. Um, and in both cases, though, the key is that we have to quantile normalize, as I showed you before, before combining the data, or else um, it doesn't work that well. Um, and also, the, the other key is that um, the Gaussian mixture model by itself is much better than using k-means, uh, but um, it runs into problems unless you control the, the parameters very, very tightly. You can allow the means to to, to, to move about, but you have to control uh, uh, the other parameters such as the variance and the, uh, the ratio of, 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 uh, of peak, uh, uh, peak areas. But the bottom line is that um, the accuracy of this deconvolution step is increased using the Gaussian mix, mixture model uh, protocol and also by increasing the, uh, the, the sample sizes. So, as I said, uh, one of the things that, that what, what Chad pointed out was that sometimes uh, the two expression values will get misassigned. So why, why does that happen? 
the first thing, or the zero thing, is that the obvious thing is the means are too close together. Now, this isn't really a bad thing. If they, they're actually on top of each other, uh, if you misassign them, it has, has essentially no impact on, on, on anything. It's only, it's only if, you, if they're on top of each other, you don't recognize they're on top of each other, and you try to assign some noise, that this becomes a problem. Um, so the, the second reason, the reason number one here, is that the k-means based methodology reasoning is, is just not reliable. And I'll show you some data for that in a second. Um, now, a better way of doing this is using a Gaussian mixture model. But if you do this naively, as I said before, without tight control of uh, the other uh, parameters, this also uh, can arise in artifacts and makes mistakes. And the third thing, uh, really, is sample size. Uh, with 50 to 100 beads that you're looking at, there are, I'll, I'll show you cases where even if you do the, um, uh, the, the deconvolution very, very carefully uh, and the means aren't too close there, you still sometimes get a, a, a switching of values. Okay, uh, so um, when I started this, I, uh, I was trying to figure exactly first what, what the Broad was doing. If you look through L1K tools, these are, they don't actually tell you in detail what they're doing um, for the deconvolution. So if you take a look at their L1K tools um, and you read the code, they take k-means, uh, uh, do the clustering, and they start with 10, 10 different random start points because uh, k-means can depend on, on your start points. It usually does depend on your start points, how, how your clustering works. Uh, and they use at least 10 beads, and then uh, they use the, the two clusters in order to determine the uh, uh, they take the medians of the two clusters, and that's how they get two values. Um, now, recently, there's been a paper published by Lou et al., um, where they actually describe the, the Broad methodology in more detail. And so apparently, what according to them, what they do is they uh, uh, take k-means, with, and they, they cluster with two, three, or four clusters, and they pick the, the the, the cluster scenario which fits the ratio of of uh, of beads the best. Um, so uh, what that ratio is, I'm not exactly sure. I've seen uh, three different descriptions of what the ratios are. Uh, according to the to Lou et al, it, the the beads are 0 0.625 to 0.375, the, the two the, the mixture of beads. Uh, other, the other places in the Broad documentation is 0.65 to 0.35, or 0.7 to, point, or to, to, to 0.3. It's roughly two to one. That's that's. Uh, but uh, uh, apart from that, I really don't know. So, uh, Lou et al. described a uh, a better method of deconvolution, which uses a fuzzy C means, which is just a fancy K means, really, um, to to seed, to, to to initially detect the. Uh, uh, where the means are, and the Gaussian mixture model to, to fit uh, and, and, the, and to uh, get the final value for where the means are. And they also have an R package, I think, which was, which was published before the paper. And they use a, 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 a similar protocol. It's not exactly the same protocol. But again, it, it's trying to fit uh, a Gaussian mixture model to the, uh, the, the two, two components. So let's see how this works, how well this works according to the paper. Uh, and this is from their paper. Um, so what they did in order to get um, a sort of ground truth um, is they looked at uh, different uh, situations, different uh, in the data, where the um, the peaks were the two the two analytes were very clearly separated. Um, sometimes uh, uh, that's on the left on the top up there, and sometimes they weren't separated, well separated. And they ignored those cases. For the ones that were separated, uh, the Gaussian mixture model was able to get almost 95% accuracy, according to them. Uh, the k-means was, was much, much lower, 76% accuracy. And they attribute that to uh, the method of, uh, that the, the Broad was using, where they're, they're um, sometimes they, um, when, when they're trying to cluster more than um, use it to use k-means to separate into more than two clusters, and the idea is that um, some of the, some of the smaller clusters will be noise. You can segregate some of the noise that way, but sometimes what happens was that the noise got picked, and uh, that's that was the according to them the main difference between 
uh, the Gaussian mixture model and the uh, the key means. But in any case, the, the Gaussian mixture model in their hands was was much more effective. Um, but um, this figure I got from uh, their their R package, the the same group, um, where they they show their Gaussian mixture model uh, separating out um, uh, two components. And this is actually, a, uh, ironically, an example of where uh, the Gaussian mix mixture model can fail. You take a look at the red, uh, red, uh, red component. Um, really, let's see if I can show this thing. Okay, 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 I got that. Really, I mean, what it probably should be doing is, is hitting, separating this component, this peak. Um, but what happens? Uh, in in uh, these uh, expectation maximization uh, models, sometimes is that the the uh, the algorithm tries to incorporate these outliers, and the easiest way to incorporate the outliers is to make uh, the one of the uh, mixture models really really wide, and this happens all the time. If you don't if you don't tightly control for the um, uh, the variance, you will get uh, a lot of these very very wide peaks, which is which is not what you see uh, when you take a look at uh, uh, at the signals from the the really good good signals that I, I've been showing you from uh, the combination of the of the uh, uh, of a thousand control wells. You actually see uh, peaks with roughly the same variance. So this type of thing is 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 wrong. And what that does so is that this miscalls this this gene. This becomes a larger component. This becomes a smaller component. So, uh, one improvement that can be made over the GMM protocol, the naive GMM protocol, is to tightly control the the, uh, the variance. Um, now, the other thing that I want to talk about this is um, a misassignment due to sampling variation. Now, even though the beads are mixed in roughly a two-to-one mixture. Sometimes, just by random chance, uh, the lower mixture will wind up with more more beads if you just sample them. This this can happen, uh, and you can quantify that. It's just a binomial distribution, and I have basically done that here. Um, this distribution on top, this histogram, shows you the distribution of, of beads in 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 a well. Uh, most of them, most wells have roughly 90 beads, uh, 90 to 100 beads um, uh, of one type. And the little red here shows you how many of these would be, how many times you would expect to see uh, the, 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 the smaller proportion give rise to more beads. It actually, it actually isn't that significant. Uh, I just want to mention it because this is what you would think might be the problem, but it really isn't. After about 35 beads, uh, it, the, uh, the the likelihood of that happening is is, is less than one percent. After I think around hundred beads, it's less than less than one in a thousand. So it's it's not it's not super significant. But sampling size still uh, is is significant. I'll, and I'll show you. It, it it's more subtle than that. Um, that's right. There. Let's go to the next one. Okay. So here, let's take a look at uh, being analyte like one forty. This is what I get when I look at the composite signal from 767 wells. So I'm looking at tens of thousands of, of beads of, of data points. It forms, even though these are fairly tightly together, it's very easy to fit by eye, and, and you can see that the Gaussian mixture model uh, also fits the peaks very, very well. If you go down and take, go from 767 wells, and are you and looking at the signal from uh, the three wells, you still get the, the uh, uh, roughly the right uh, uh, fitting. If you go on it down to one well, though, uh, it's uh, the uh, the assignments are switched, and it's not. Uh, and and it and this is not really like it's not bad data. This is actually part of this data. Uh, it's a subset of this data. What's happened here is just a couple of the these these values here, a couple of outlier values here, uh, have moved, have switched a little bit, and so. I don't actually think the the, uh, the fitting algorithm is incorrect. It's just that we have some sampling variation here, which causes the the the, the, uh, the values um, between the two 
the, the two populations, at the extreme of the two populations, to, to to switch a little bit, and that causes the the uh, uh, the fitting to change a little bit. And this is very very hard to get rid of uh, because you can get rid of uh, outliers. I hear you detect this, but how are you going to detect outliers in the in the middle? Um, the the best way to deal with this is to use more more uh, more beads. Use a larger sample. Then you don't have to worry about this. It becomes much, much less of a problem. Uh, and again, I, I want to emphasize that right now, the way that this is being done, uh, we 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 treat them all single wells. And if if it don't give if they don't give a consistent answer, we throw out the data. Um, in this manner, we don't throw out the data. We actually use it. We use the combined data in order to get uh, a, a better signal. Um, so, I think I've shown you something which is reasonable, which makes sense. But some, sometimes things, often things that are reasonable, make sense, don't actually work. So here's something that shows you that this actually is working. Um, so what I have done, the first, the first row here, is take a look at um, control wells from the same plate, and ask myself, uh, when I deconvolute the values, how different are they? How much variation am I getting from control wells from the same plate? And the RMSD, which um, is just a root mean square deviation, it's just a, a fancy way of looking at the, the average difference, the pos average positive difference, uh, is 1.2. It's also the same for, for broad data and also the same for normalized data, which tells me uh, that a lot of the variation is, is, is uh, uh, between plates and not, not within plates, which sort of makes sense. Um, now, these are the, the more interesting columns here. So what I've done here is first, I've taken all the control wells, as I said before, and I've combined the data and then um, got deconvoluted them and got values for, for each of the gene expression values. And I've done exactly the same thing using one well, two wells, three wells, or four wells from, and these are control wells. Uh, but they're from different plates, and ask myself how different are the values then? And what we can see is that um, if you don't normalize, you get some improvement, but it's not a hell of a lot. If you normalize, then the combination you're lo really looking at, you really can treat them as as a uh, uh, a single data set. Um, and the the, the the, uh, the, you can see that the variation is much, much less. So we're going almost half a log difference here, which is, which is really, really different, which is really, really quite significant. And, and uh, also, this is using the, uh, the um, um, this is also using the, the better uh, GMM technique uh, as well on top of the, the improvement that we're getting from just using larger samples. Uh, so this is basically a summary of, of the, um, uh, the the pipeline and the differences in the pipeline. So with with Broad, the idea is to uh, take the uh, the individual wells, deconvolute them, deconvolute them, and which gives you uh, a set of gene expression values, and then you do set manipulations, and then you do your comparison. Um, the LK, L1K plus plus pipeline uh, takes the, the, the different wells, combines them, and normalizes them so that the, the, the combination is done in a robust manner, uh, and then does the deconvolution. And then it can join up with the, uh, with the, uh, the existing uh, uh, broad pipeline. Um, and I've put double, double uh, arrows here because, again, uh, I, I, the, this is a very, very fast pipeline, so we can regenerate this, tweak this, take a look at the data, go back and take a look at the immediate data very, very easily. All right, so finally, uh, some things that are still left to do. Um, the Broad pipeline uh, has that normalization step, that list normalization step, uh, which we don't uh, use. And it, I don't, from what I've seen, it doesn't, looked at the data, it doesn't seem to work all that well. But it is necessary to to have something to convert these uh, bead-based values into something comparable to Affymetrix values in order to recreate the, uh, the level three data. So we're looking at uh, uh, geo-based 
data sets in order to do the normalization uh, uh, across across the entire uh, uh, or uh, the entire gene set, rather than just just the uh, the, the controls uh, the ten the ten uh, sets of controls uh, that uh, the pro uses for lists. Now, uh, most of the work that I've done has been with working with look at controls and not looking at uh, things where there are changes in, in, in the data. And so uh, I, I expect that's not going to make a uh, difference because I have looked at the, uh, uh, the treatment data as an aggregate and it doesn't look all much, that much different from the control data, which makes sense because most of the treatments are going to be null. But um, at, at least when we're looking at, at, uh, at uh, small compounds. So, but uh, I, I anticipate there's going to be some, some more tuning done when I uh, take a close look at the, some of the positive controls, knockdowns over expression. And we're looking into uh, getting some independent geo data sets so we can have a, uh, a separate gold standard to, to, to make sure that everything is actually working. Um, another thing that uh, I've, I've avoided talking about is are the few cases where the noise isn't completely normalized out. Um, if you take a look at and this is less than I would, I think, one or two percent of the analytes. There is still some of that uh, that noise left out. You don't get the sharp peaks that uh, that you would like to see, at, that you would expect to see if they all came from the same population. And I think some of this is due to beat batch variation. And, and Chad saw some of this, uh, uh, which he presented in in, uh, in earlier webinars. Um, so uh, this is something we can tweak. Take a look at some of the uh, the other uh, uh, conditions uh, when we're looking at the. Uh, I mean, our, our basic shins. Um, oops. Uh, also, um, we can do some pros, uh, post processing. Um, even though uh, increasing the sample size, companion data does reduce the, the variation, there's going to be some situations where you're going to get this, this flipping still. So we can do some post, pros, pros, post processing uh, to try to deal with that. Um, if not actually unflip it, at least at least incorporate that into the uh, the inferences. And finally, um, what I'd like to do is uh, get back to uh, what I would start doing, which was uh, doing some network inferences using uh, 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 Bayesian models. Uh, and eventually, I, I think the data is is getting to the point where uh, we can actually start doing what uh, we were we intended to do in the first place, which was to uh, to infer some genetic networks. Um, and these are uh, some of the people that uh, that have been uh, working in uh, uh, on this project uh, in in our group. Uh, thank you, Hong. That's a great presentation. So, um, questions? Anybody? I have a question. So, when you said that uh, you're looking for some geo data sets to mm -hmm. uh, improve the normalization and also do like some more benchmarking with knockdowns. So what exactly uh, do, are you looking for? And what type of benchmarks are you planning to do, like more of like upstream after you're sort of like, uh, you have like a lot of like low uh, intermediate level benchmarks, but not necessarily in what we've been doing a lot is like those um, benchmarks where we have a different pipeline and then we check it at sort of like at the signature level. So that's the what I'm. Okay. Uh, okay. The two two parts of that. Um, the the two parts where the geo data set comes in. One is to um, right now the scale of the data that's being generated by our pipeline uh, is different from the Affymetrix data. So um, one thing that very simple to do is just to find uh, geo data sets which are uh, on, on on the entire um, uh, human genome, and then and then use that to 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 uh, convert our values to to something closer to metric value. So that's a simple thing. The second thing is, um, as you said, so far we've looked at low level stuff, low level intermediate stuff. You really want to see how this this percolates up to signatures, which is what we really care about. And so um, with the geo data set, we're trying to find something. Um, um, some some examples where we know there are changes in gene expression. Not not at the signature level, but at least at the expression level, and to see whether um, 
if we gather enough of those, whether uh, we can predict those better using this pipeline than the broad pipeline. So it's a, an independent data set is what we're looking for. I think one of the success that, that we had was that if you look at the drug and uh, you're looking at the ranking of the target, uh, you will not get much success, but if you look at the interactions of the target with the known protein protein interactions, then you will get a signal. Like you'll get a higher ranking of the target direct interactors as differentially expressed. And then you can do this type of benchmark between okay. your method and the bro. Okay. Um, That's without GEO, actually. Okay. But the, the, we also have a data set of um, GEO drug perturbations. Oh, great. And, and there's also the old connectivity map. So I don't know if you uh, looked at that or aware of it, but there is um, the first version of the connectivity map. It's affymetrics, and there's like 6,000 uh, affymetrics microarrays with uh, very similar cell lines and the uh, same perturbations. Oh, that's good. Uh, that's good. That, that'd be great. Yeah, so that can be also would be perfect for the benchmarks. Mm -hmm. and that's on the, uh, if you look for the connectivity map, like it's called CMAP. So that sounds great. That's exactly what type of thing we're looking for. And also to be aware of that they have, they're going to release uh, in two weeks uh, a huge batch of data into GEO of L1000 data. So the L1000 data is going to go into GEO and it's going to be phase two data. And that's supposed to happen on June 30th. Uh, Hong, I have a question. This is Mario speaking. Uh, so you basically use up kind of uh, replicated data in the convolution step. So at the end of the story, you have a single measurement for a gene, right? Yes. OK. So uh, right, right. Now, I'm just pondering, because previously you had these replicated measurements, so you had the measure of variance, right, of what happens from one plate to another for the same treatment. Uh, in this process, you kind of end up just with a measure without the. Well, you can still get, it, uh, you can still get a decent inference model from there. Um, basically, the, it, the 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 um, the calculations are, are so fast that uh, you could you could do a, a million simulations a few seconds and get get a decent inference model without using replicates. And you can also, if you want. And I, uh, you can also treat the uh, uh, because again because this is this is really fast it's just a couple of extra hours of work you can get back uh, you can just treat the controls as as one single uh, set of numbers and still do your treatments as replicates if you want. Okay, so uh, what's your uh, timeline on releasing this uh, in terms of writing a paper or pub uh, publishing the code huh? and. Uh, Making it available uh, soon, really. Uh, we I like to make sure that everything is is reasonable first. Uh, it takes a little bit of uh, time to go through and and take a look at all the data, uh, but uh, uh, soon. All right, so we'll end up then uh, right at the at the time. Uh, thank you all for uh, listening and visiting. Uh, hope to see you next time. Thank you, Hong. That was that was a great presentation.